Hello and welcome to the DM's Book Club, a weekly book club podcast where we talk about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include them in our role-playing campaigns, except that's not what we're doing today, absolutely at all. My wonderful guest host is here. Uh, guest host, could you introduce yourself to our wonderful listeners? Hello, my name's Jordan. I am a big book lover and reader and I have a book podcast called Books to Last mm-hmm. where guests come on and pick five books they would take with them to a desert island. So, uh Yes, slightly off piece, but uh, very, very happy to be here. Absolutely. And and I was very lucky enough to go on Books to Last very recently and talk about all the books and also talk about role playing games uh, with you. And th- this has just been an excellent sort of couple of week- months, really. I was emailing back and forth, being very excited about talking to each other. Why did you get into reading? What was sort of your origin story into like reading and getting to where you are now, essentially, having a book club podcast all about it? Reading is one of those things I kind of always did, especially as a child. And I do think a big part of it is probably escapism. It's funny, hindsight's an amazing thing. I've recently learned, gone on a whole journey and learned that I'm um, neurodivergent. I've been diagnosed with um, autistic spectrum disorder. And reading and books is basically one of my areas of quote unquote special interest. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, in hindsight, looking back at my childhood and, you know, my own personal development and stuff, I can see now that reading was probably a bit of a coping mechanism as well, because sort of being really entranced with stories and characters and sort of escaping the real world for a little bit was um, something that I really enjoyed. And then it's kind of just followed me through my entire adult life. I really like stories. They make me think about things in a way that like non, I mean, I love nonfiction as well, but they make me think about things in a way nonfiction and mm-hmm. sort of fact and education sort of don't. It just is a little bit more of a uh, flexible space, I think. So yeah, I've always read and I've ended up with the podcast because I, I, I've always been a part of like the online book community and I like talking about books with other people who like books because I don't have a ton of readers in my own sort of in real life circle. Mm. The podcast was kind of just an excuse for me to um, email people on the internet and say, can we talk about books? (laughs) (laughs) And have a pretext for doing that because apparently... Society thinks it's weird if you just do that for no other reason. <laughs> but if you record it and share it with the world, that's a perfectly valid reason to do that. Yeah, that, I mean, that's exactly what brought about any of my podcasts was because I, I too, like really enjoyed a certain hobby or a certain thing. But like, this is really cool. How else can I, you know, make this like worthwhile in quotation marks? How can I like connect with people? And it's all very well, like you said, like being part of a, a like forum or stuff like that. But sometimes it's you know really difficult. So you might be like, hey, just come and talk to me for an hour and a half and yeah, you know, go out on the internet, I guess. Uh, so I, I definitely feel that. And the same thing, like I feel like obviously reading books and role playing games, they do go sort of hand in hand in general. But that idea of escapism and just being able to go away from what is real life for now for a couple of hours and explore and experience and feel things as well. There's always that joke about like, oh, have your fictional characters uh, had feelings? Uh, and that's why you're a bit upset and or a bit sort of like emotional because something has happened in the book. And it's the same thing with role playing games is this idea of like uh, emotional bleed that, you know, your characters have done something epic or something very scary and then it bleeds over into, into you after done the game. Yeah. Uh, a really exciting sort of topic today because I sort of asked you to have a think about your sort of favourite sort of book series uh, or series as we've got in our emails and what I thought we'd do because I know you're not necessarily into role playing games or yet yet is the answer there yet (laughs) and it's just about like how can we take any sort of book series that someone has read and create a setting or an idea for a campaign a seed as it were because I feel like a lot of people that is a struggle with because people want to you know run stories that they've seen on tv or read in books but it's like how do we do that without you know because some people like I don't want to necessarily just copy you know the structure or the copy the plot lines because then other people will realize etc so I thought we talk about the book series that you picked and then we'll just run through a couple of like sort of uh, writing exercise with prompts essentially but we'll just talk them through and then we'll just obviously come up with a, a really cool setting at the end for for you to take away <laughs> and play with if you wish but just in general just to talk about how the overlap between reading and yeah. role-playing games comes together exciting yeah i am um, i mean one of the big things i really love because I'm, I'm really big into sort of sci-fi and fantasy is um complete world building mm. from scratch is i find it a really interesting craft because you can tell especially when you read a lot within genres, you can tell when an author has done the work, it's very, very blatant in the writing. So, I mean, 
everyone that I know who loves Tolkien, for instance, it's like when you read Tolkien, it doesn't matter that all of the information about every part of Middle Earth isn't there. You know that Tolkien knows exactly where every blade of grass in, <laughs> in that universe is. He he understands the entire geography. He understands everything about it. And it's mm. all like lived in his mind, mm. which is why it feels like such a real and fully realized thing. Whereas there are some authors who maybe world building isn't where their strengths are, but they're sort of better with characters or plot or that sort of mm. thing. And it's more surface level and you can feel when a world has been grown mm. with the story as opposed mm. to having been built and then the story grew within it. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and that's something with role playing games as well is that, uh, you know, as a game facilitator or a dungeon master, do you think about like building the world and then just having your players just have a go? And because no world survives uh, impact with the players, you know, that, that's <laughs> as this, those sorts of things. But or do you have like a mission or adventure in mind and then build the world around it? Because both of those are completely valid. You know, do you go for story or do you go for world? I think there's something magical if you've got a certain. I always say vibes because I'm I'm trying to be a cool young kid. Um, but if you've got a certain vibe or a certain genre that you're like, oh, I really want to this is really cool how do i put this into the world then obviously going from like let's go from the outside in and and just see from there essentially so yeah, yeah I, so yeah so we don't have to worry too much about plot today that that could be another episode <laughs> but today we're just going to focus on trying to build a world or build parts of worlds from the book series which you've picked so what is the series that or oh, series sorry that you sort of picked and why have you chosen it Okay, so you asked me what my favourite book or series was, and I was yeah. like, that's an impossible question, which is <laughs> probably really unfair for me to say, because I kind of made you come on my podcast and pick only five that were yeah. your favourite books. <laughs> yeah. I make people do that on a regular basis, but I often sort of re- immediately clutch my pearls and go, oh, it's not fair, you couldn't possibly ask me the same question. <laughs> oh. How could I choose between my children? <laughs> but immediately, especially in terms of worlds that I would like to occupy, because there's some mm. incredibly obvious, incredible big series where you actually don't need to think oh what would it be like because there's been incredible amounts of money put into the idea that you can actually go and find out what it's like to go and live and experience that Mm -hmm. world Mm -hmm. so I tried to go for some things that have had a little bit less thing and and that worlds I would genuinely want to live in so there Mm -hmm. is a series which is one of my favorite and I think incredibly underrated fantasy series called the Mm -hmm. gentleman bastard sequence which is about a sort of gang of thieves who undertake huge heists and scams on the elite of their society using sort of confidence games and disguises and tricks and that sort of thing Mm -hmm. and they're kind of like robin hood but instead of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor they still steal from the rich and then keep it all for themselves no so the author's called scott lynch and the world that he created is incredibly rich and also full of vibes it's got really big sort of assassin's creed renaissance italy but also gas lamp fantasy magic Mm -hmm. type vibes where they've got alchemists and yeah there's mages that, uh, that live in different parts of the world and he's really created like an amazing sort of geography but you can feel you can feel which city each city mm. is meant to be mm-hmm, <laughs> when mm-hmm. you're in them. And in the series, they've done a book that was sort of the original one, which was like your classic sort of thief plot. The second one, which had both pirates and an art heist, nice. which I wouldn't have thought those two things would mix, but it was it's, it's probably my favorite one because mm-hmm. the pirates are just hands down. Like I could have a book just mm. about the pirates of this world and have nothing oh. to do with the thieves that are actually Ooh. the main characters. Uh, then the third book is sort of centered around a play within the book but also a political sort Mm. of political war games between two warring factions and there's an election and they're trying to influence that basically using and there's supposed to be seven books in the series three have only come out we have been waiting i think it's nearly 15 years for the fourth one oh right okay (laughs) <laughs> so to be honest i'm not confident i'm ever going to see the end of this series and have any more of this world so i may as well just make up some stuff that sounds awesome so yeah we've got loads of things to play with though so like this yeah i'm always a big fan of political intrigue yeah, like i said it's very rich sort of the renaissance so instantly we've got that sort of architecture there thieves in general like thieves guilds they're just fun they're fun <laughs> uh and it feels like just again from the outside just just thinking about this particular series like 
no one's the good person in this. Everyone's sort of like, no. <laughs> which is interesting because a lot of fantasy, obviously you, you are the good adventurers. So this is a world which is, again, it's, it's very silly to be like, oh, there's good worlds and bad worlds. You know, there's yeah. a whole thing. I'm sure you've heard about the alignment and stuff. It's, yeah. it's, it's more of a greyish area. I live in morally grey. I love it. <laughs> well, this is a, it's a morally grey world for the players to play in. So it feels a bit more like when we see like games like, you know, like Baldur's Gate or any of these sort of like a, you know, video game RPGs where your choice is not on a, a on a strict plane of like yes this is a good thing this is a good thing yeah. you could change and and develop over time but ultimately this is feels like a very selfish world and in a sense of like you're looking out for number one because otherwise yes. someone else's number one is going to get you and you're just going to become at the bottom of the pile not even you know not even number two you're just like dead right <laughs> yeah i always sort of have this whenever i'm speaking about books with people i mean i've met very few people who've read this series all of them who've read it have enjoyed it which is good mm. but um it's not hugely popular even though it's got sort of um blurbs from J- george R. R. martin like he mm. he he gave this his gold stamp of approval it's so it's an it's a really good series but yeah it's one of those that like i always joke that i mean i can't generally tolerate morally gray in my own life in real life <laughs> it's very black and white i like i'm very much like i understand the difference between right and wrong i've been taught what right and wrong is mm. and even though there's sort of you know gray areas in some aspects of like i don't know moral dilemmas that i think i've never had to come across them so for me personally it's quite easy for me to think in black and white Mm. i love morally gray characters and morally gray situations in reading because i suppose it's something that i don't really experience but yes yeah it's a really interesting one and it's one that i really want to reread but i'm worried if i reread it i'm going to just get frustrated again about the fact that the fourth book is still not here scott lynch (laughs) (laughs) but that's interesting that you want to be able to explore these sort of themes that's separate to say, say like you said that your life is not like this. You know, you, you know the right from wrong, all that sort of thing. To be able to explore this, I'm incredibly boring. <laughs> no, not at all. But I think this, this, this is a way for you to safely explore these themes through reading, yeah. and then and I can I can imagine the same for you if you we were playing a, an RPG with this sort of setting that that, that you would find yeah. the choices that people made like. It's just like, oh, yeah. what, what are we going to do? You know, and that's the engaging part of it. I love the concept of being sort of a mastermind thief who can like get out <laughs> of anything. It sounds amazing, but I do not have the, the nerve or guts for that. But I'd love to pretend to be a character like that. That would be fun. <laughs> let's start with that then so i have an exercise here so i'm going to be using today uh, the ultimate rpg game masters world building guide by james damato uh, again a long uh, lengthy title uh, but in this book there is so many like different it goes into different genres about like building certain elements of your games if there are specific genres but i've gone for the one neutral at the back so because i thought rather than like put it into a box to be like oh this is mm. fantasy this is sci-fi etc we'd go for one of the neutral ones just to start with and just to play us along a little bit and what we're going to do we're just going to go through it this particular exercise and just take our time with it and just talk things through we don't need to make too many notes i might make a few notes just so that we can summarize at the end mm. but ultimately uh, it's more of a discussion about how we would build something in this uh, so from these vibes as i keep saying <laughs> so this exercise is called we built this city and then in brackets it says on talk and rolls Mm -hmm. so every city is a world in its own right they develop customs landscapes and languages that someone could spend a lifetime studying that makes them a wicked problem for world building especially in rpgs player characters can pack years of adventure into a few square blocks or visit a marvelous metropolis for a day before moving on to discover something new this exercise will help you make an outline for a city with a distinct character that will fit almost any genre You will then populate it with iconic landmarks, residents, or rumours to ensure that your player characters will always remember this. So the basics is that a city can mean a thousand different things. Chicago, Venice, and Las Vegas are all cities, but they all look and feel completely different. Their population, shape, age, and wealth have helped them to develop unique traits. So we're going to go through those uh, four sort of factors first. So we're going to go through the population, shape, age, and wealth. So population, to make a city, you need a rough idea how many people live in it. Numbers won't really tell you anything. In fiction, big cities can be hundreds or two trillions of residents. Instead, focus on how large that population is compared to other places in the world and the physical space this city occupies. So what I'm going to do, you've got four choices here and I'll read them out for you. And then from those four choices, as well as sort of describing what, how big the city is that we're going to put into the setting, you're going to be able to get something a little bit later called either an eccentricity or an asset or a corruption, which is on a table at the back. And then we can choose those as well. So we'll make a bit of note about that. These are more the unique elements of the city. Okay. You have four choices. So either your city that you've got is large, 
medium, small, or spare. So thinking about you're starting off your players in a city that is, is inspired by the gentleman bastards mm-hmm. how big do you think this city is so generally the setting for these is large and i think mm-hmm. that tends to add because there's unevenly distributed but especially in places like slums or the poor areas it's like an idea that they're incredibly overcrowded and overpopulated hence why there's unequal opportunities and therefore the underground or thieving guilds tend to thrive and they have plenty of uh, things so i like the idea of a large city which again jars with my own personal because i love living in rural areas with very few people (laughs) it's a proper thing isn't it it's the opposites i really don't do cities like generally speaking Uh, okay, so large, so this city has one of the densest populations in the world. There are many special adaptations that will allow it to accommodate so many. So with that, you get either one eccentricity or one mm-hmm. asset. Which one would you like, an asset or an eccentricity? I think an eccentricity, uh, okay. because that sounds fun and interesting. <laughs> sounds fun and interesting, and Fiona can't say it, so good job. Uh, <laughs> so... I'm going to read out the options that you have. So this, this is something you can take. So there's a table at the back, essentially, which has got all these sort of options. And it just gives you a flavor of like, oh, here's something as a, as a trait or as a, as a something that you could build into it. Now, obviously, I know you obviously have got an idea of what the world might be. But these things could also be like, oh, yeah, this builds into this or and just or goes a completely different spin. So whilst we're using uh, your books as a sort of a jumping off point, feel free to be like, actually, sod the books. This is interesting, <laughs> you know. So we have the city is built around inconvenient geography. The city was developed for very unusual transportation infrastructure. The city was built around and above an ancient metropolis. Wildlife and nature are incorporated into the city. The city was the setting for an iconic story or historical event that has embraced that identity. Historical disasters uh, necessitate unique development. The city regularly experiences extreme weather. Or the city isn't laid out on a grid. So you've got a lot of choices there. So, yeah, they all sound really interesting. And funnily enough, when you were listing them, I could kind of, I actually could imagine like specific, very fictional cities that definitely take advantage of those uh, different things. Mm. The last one actually kind of stood out to me because it, the idea that it's not laid out on a grid, uh, for people who cannot tell from my accent, I too am from the UK. And generally speaking, our cities make no sense in their structure whatsoever so because true. we do not build on a grid. <laughs> Unlike most countries, which, um, you know, have got their urban planning together, but it's, mm. it's one of our quirks. We like roads that aren't big enough for the cars we drive on them <laughs> but the ones that stood out to me were mm. probably the first two and to be honest my answer would probably go for either of them because i'm still kind of thinking about Camor, which is the mm. uh, main city that we start in the gentleman bastard sequence mm-hmm. which is based on venice mm. now you could probably argue that building a city around canals could be inconvenient geography or mm. basing it around a slightly unique transport system you know gondolas basically mm. so i don't know which one of those it fits better but mm. i very much liked the idea because you know you have the canals yeah link everything they're quite easy to use incognito but also can be used for spectacle and Mm. dried out ones where people have to walk through sort of the basin of them where it's all awful and you can see everything that the water hid and Mm. you know there's like little layers of metaphor there (laughs) i think there's a lot to explore with it and i think it makes it really interesting yeah but I feel obliged to say, as somebody who works in uh, Birmingham, which is, uh, you know, the UK's second city, despite what Manchester wants everyone to think, (laughs) we technically have more miles of canal than Venice in Birmingham. It's a a point that we... uh, plaster over it i say we i don't live there and never have but you, you're just you're just advertising <laughs> i work but... there yes i work there and i'm very proud to do so so yes uh birmingham more miles of a uh, canal than venice although mm. venice is probably nicer we don't get dolphins in the canals in birmingham so mm. well in this world maybe no right? maybe so... not but there might be there might be dolphins in this uh, in the one in the fictional <laughs> world that we've come up with i think then i uh, just from what you described me i think instantly this sort of world again that idea there's going to be lots of high-speed chases high system so it does feel like that transportation is unusual because then you'd have to develop uh again later on the round this is just mm-hmm. speculation to that you have to develop okay so yes there's gondolas that they can get away with so there'll be chases and stuff you know canals especially seem to be like a huge theme of cities that have this very similar vibe because mm-hmm. different book series but the six of crows series by lee bardugo Ketterdam, which is obviously based on Amsterdam mm. in the Netherlands, which is also very heavily sort of canal centric. Mm-hmm. 
And again, it seems to be like an ongoing theme. I don't know what about canals basically makes every author go crime. Definitely crime. <laughs> <laughs> definitely shady. Yeah, shady business going on in the canal. There's definitely nothing else happening. Here. <laughs> yeah, but that's it. So yeah, so let's let's go back. So you've got a, so currently you've got a very large city with this unusual transportation, which we, I mean, I, are you happy for it to be uh, canals? Yes. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll go Although for that. I've, I've read some very interesting books that have sort of like cable car sort of, Mm. ways of transporting but i feel like that um i mean to be fair in the event of a chase cutting a cable car would be a very dramatic so So maybe maybe you have two different ways of going around this particular city like i love a zeppelin as well oh Oh, yeah put a zeppelin in god damn it yeah (laughs) i love i love a zeppelin or a dirigible or whatever the hell literally there's a, a zeppelin blimp dirigible airship they've all got different lines some of them are more dangerous than others but who yes but which one you don't know till you're on there i think this, uh, yeah. but i like this now we've got three different types of transport mm. which could mean different things so like obviously the stakes are high higher yeah. literally and figuratively uh, depending on where you are so uh, yeah why, why not have this place that, that mm-hmm. has uh canals cable cars and uh dirigibles like yeah Fuck it, let's do it. It's your Probably world. not skyscrapers, considering the the, mm. uh, the 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 infrastructure that would describe. Probably not mm. terribly tall buildings. That probably no, work, no. But still, apart from that. All right. Well, let's go on to the second factor, which is shape. So, after population, mm-hmm. most people look to the physical size as a characteristic for the cities. The amount of space a city takes up is less important than how the space is used. The shape of your city says a lot about how the people live in it. So again, you've got four options. And again, each of these options will have something on that table as well. So you have sprawling, you have contained, planned, or condensed. Those are the two options of the shape. I like the idea of sprawling, but when you first brought the question up, I immediately thought of a more contained view because Mm. speaking of crime ridden cities, which this one is completely different, but Gotham City in the Mm. DC universe, because it's basically New York, is basically thought of to be very, it's quite contained and it's connected to the rest of don't know actually which <laughs> which part of the um, mm. fictional country Gotham is connected to, but it's connected to the rest of the country by a series of bridges like mm. Manhattan is mm-hmm. with rivers around it. And mm. there's a really great story in the Batman series called No Man's Land, I think, where everything goes wrong in Gotham and the rest of the country basically, instead of going in to help them, says, you're on your own mm. and basically mm. shuts down all of the bridges and... Mm contains it basically and it's uh i think it's a good plot device yeah when something's contained it's very easy to cut it off from the rest of it and then mm. therefore eliminate escape routes having it so it is definitely a more urban adventure so that mm. as it sort of talked about it's like sometimes you just visit it for the day and then it's like right on on we go to the rest of this world that we've put together and you're like no no the bridges are out oh no what a shame oh dear we're trapped <laughs> we're trapped here so you have to play along with my story london being contained by the m25 oh oh well it is you know it is <laughs> So contained is what you're thinking. That the yes. shape of the fan. Fantastic. So again, that's another e. Uh, e- oh God, I can't say it. an eccentricity. Oh, the second one. The, uh, the that same sort of options. <laughs> I'll, I'll read them out again. Ex- eccentricity. Eccentricity. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's built around inconvenient uh, geography. Uh, we've already had unusual t- uh, transportation around or and above an ancient metropolis. Wildlife and nature are incorporated into the city. This city was the setting for an iconic historical event that has embraced it. Historical disasters necessitate necessitate (laughs) necessitate unique development. The city regularly experiences extreme weather, and the city is not laid out in the grid. So you need you get another one of those if there's another option that jumps out to you. Something to do with the historical of events possibly mm-hmm. yeah. uh, could you just read sorry i'm you don't uh, nope. have to say necessitate again but you could just read that <laughs> one mean, out, of course maybe. of course uh <laughs> historical disasters necessary oh, yeah requires unique Require. development yeah possibly that one because i yeah. do like the incorporation of a bit of magic because i i like that mm. it's magic that makes sense it's magic that's closer to what they would think of as science Mm-hmm. So it's like, ah, oh, we have these wonderful materials that just do these things. And they've always done these things, even though that sounds like fanciful, I suppose. No, I love that. I love that. So yeah, so that's the thing. So historical disasters, it could be, yeah, like you said, it is either related to magic or science or something. Mm-hmm. And as a result, they're in this particular world that we're creating. Uh, there's rules and regulations around it. Probably a war. <laughs> uh, there's always a bloody war somewhere. A war. The next one I've got is age. 
So cities grow like people and age like liquor. They trade potential for strength and ability, and slowly their sweetness ferments into a rich and alluring poison. The older a city is, the more its problems become its identity. Younger cities lack complicated history and character in kind. So again, you've got four options. Ancient, historic, modern, and new. I would probably say historic because I like ancient, but you tend to have a lot of what my mother-in-law would refer to as piles of bricks um, or ruins. As <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I quite like historic because I suppose I'm just like going with frame of reference of local cities of my own. Most of the cities in the UK or the biggest ones are quite historic, but I suppose a lot of their infrastructure is actually quite, well, not modern, but it's more, it's newer. Mm -hmm. due to sort of world wars and bombing and all that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of like the layers of different ages mm. on top of that. But I think historic is a good line for that because otherwise you end up with them. Um, I mean, York is a very ancient city. It's very, very yes. old mm. and it's beautiful, but I don't think I could ever imagine anything as awful as like thieving gangs happening in York. It's too <laughs> nice. <laughs> if Roman bats were there, then it just, it can't happen. So yeah, historic. <laughs> Historic. So this city has hundreds of years of history built into it and has seen a few different versions of it. So for that, you get a choice of either uh, one uh, eccentricity or one corruption is the corruption. other. Corruption. We're talking about a thief city. Got to be a corruption. Absolutely. All right. So these are the options you've got. So you've got law enforcement does more harm than good. The cost of living is artificially inflated. Uh, <laughs> what, what world are we living in? Uh, Organised crime is powerful. An essential public asset is controlled by corrupt parties. Part of the city has been left to, to deteriorate. The city faces a massive political challenge to enact any change. Civic leadership serves special interests before the population. Illegal activity is necessary to conduct normal businesses and violence is common. So you've got a whole range of options there. Yeah, and I'm starting to realise that a lot of the books I read, um, I think, feel like the authors have got, they pick several of these usually mm. to make it really, really tricky. Mm. I like the idea that if it's going to be centred around the underground and the underworld of this particular city, that that part of the, like the criminal element is quite powerful mm -hmm. one of the big sort of story points in the gentleman bastard sequence is that um there's an agreement called the secret peace basically mm -hmm. that anyone who is considered aristocratic or of the upper classes is off guard the thieves aren't supposed to steal from them they're not allowed to mm -hmm. then they are off guard because the agreement is is the sort of aristocratic system has an agreement with the leader of the criminal underground system that as long as they're left alone there will be minimal punishment mm. for them if they were to continue to steal from you know the merchant class and the business class and the you know the the, the general working middle class of that yeah. city yeah, yeah yeah and yeah the big point of the gentleman bastard sequence is that the gentleman bastards which is the main gang basically say nah sod that they've got more money we're gonna break the secret piece but they have to do it secretly because otherwise the rest of the underworld will turn on them and i kind of like this idea of um not li like is probably putting out i think it's a good story device mm. and maybe is a little bit too close to um <laughs> home in terms of what certain kinds of people are allowed to get away with because mm. they are because they know other kinds of people in charge so yeah interesting i like that yeah because like you said that that covers quite a few of these options uh but again this is the whole point is that it's, it's an idea of just, just a jumping off point so we could mm -hmm. pick you know pick a couple of these but i guess what for you is the sort of most important it sounds like to me like i mean ultimately that comes to me is like oh organized crime is very powerful because that is kind mm -hmm. of the vibe of the city but equally like this idea of the enforcement being corrupt yeah exactly so let's put both of those down i think that's that works for me in that sense of like, I, yeah, like ultimately it's a, well, we know it's a, it's a morally great place, isn't it? So, so good. All right. So then the final fact before we go into the real details of it is the wealth of this particular city. So cities are characterized by their relationship with wealth. Every city depends on a foundation of wealth and industry to form. The way those resources are allocated determines how a city looks and functions. So here are your four options. You've got opulent, conspicuous, fading and absent. So that is the wealth on that. So I quite like the idea of 
contrast because there's a lot of mm. cities, both in real life and in fiction, where you have half of the city, which is incredibly opulent because it's where the money lies. And then there's this sort of contrasting secret half of the city or the city that doesn't get as much attention, which because the wealth is unevenly distributed, mm-hmm. therefore is is in really poor condition. For me personally, sort of drawing on those other examples, most of the time cities like the one I'm describing in this particular story are like port cities and they mm-hmm. have an incredibly strong economy because of the trade that goes in and out of them and that is why they generally are targeted by Mm. organized crime and that sort of thing because the money's there basically and it's to do with just finding ways of getting it through on a dishonest means Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and like i say there's a whole in my city there's a whole sort of class of people that have quite a lot of money Mm. and it would do lots of things to protect it so we'll say it's a very rich but um Mm. on equal city <laughs> unequal so yeah so it feels like it's in, in between opulent and conspicuous mm. i think if you're going for if there was a line that you could go to which one would you say i would probably say conspicuous because i think opulent kind of makes me think more of i've recently been reading a lot about like the ottoman empire and their mm. cities with the um sort of really grand building and architecture projects and that sort of thing that is you know mm. That's what I think of as opulent, whereas I think this is a little bit, it's a little bit grimy in places. So I would say conspicuous, it's gaudy, it's not classy displays of wealth. It's just, um, look at me, look how much money I've got. It's very much (laughs) look at me, but then don't look too hard because there's corners that are grime filled and (laughs) stuff. Yeah. So this city has been the home to profitable industries throughout its history that has resulted in truly uh, expressive collections of achievements, monuments and institutions, which is good. And then this one, excellently, you picked. You pick the one that we don't have, which is an asset. You get an asset for this one. So very good. So here are your list of assets that we could have in the city. So we've got robust public transportation, uh, a vibrant art scene, celebrated culinary districts, exceptional schools and universities, access to unique natural or magical resources, booming industry, advanced medical care, accommodations for a specialised profession, Access to natural public spaces, robust museum and historical sites. Okay, so I'm torn. So immediately when you said food, I was like, oh, I mean, if we're set in Venice, we're going to have some really good food. And also I really love reading but any books that have good descriptions of food in it. It's, it's got me sold because I like reading about food. <laughs> but mm. I also thought, I mean, we've already discussed there is kind of a booming industry in terms of trade and that sort of thing. So mm. That's kind of already baked into what's there. I feel like you covered that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think probably maybe cuisine, but I do Mm. always really like those cities and fantasy novels that have sort of an institution that they're built around. So um, I can't remember what the name of the city in Game of Thrones is, but the one that is sort of like, Mm. it's well known for furnishing like the entire world with, you know, their... um, magisters and they're very wise people because Mm. and that's their export basically it's like incredibly intelligent monks that run entire political system this this does not sound great maybe we should uh get some other person in but yeah but that city really likes having that that level of power and i've seen i mean um i forget what the name of the city is now but the city that in this world that has like the bonds mage is just like basically they're Mm. kind of like in the witcher Mm. where yet the school yennefer goes to basically where they basically ship out all of their witches and wizards to go and work in royal houses when really they're they're not they're supposed to be there as employees but they're not they're there influencing it the way the wizard tower wants it to be influenced and i always think that's a really good concept but i feel like the city's probably got enough going on so i think booming industry and really good food would be good because yeah. you know you've got to you've got to eat good food while you're plotting heists That's oh absolutely generally the rule. yeah i will instantly i now see like all right when the player characters are in their downtime they're having dinner and they're having yes. these so you can have instantly really interesting scenes um, or maybe even very tense scenes where you're having mm. a standoff over dinner possibly not spaghetti though i think spaghetti diffuses a lot of tension yeah yeah <laughs> For me, my gut, when you're describing those food stuff, I was like, oh yeah, because that feels, I again, I haven't played in any RPGs that focus on eating mm. and food stuff. And one of the things, again, pre-pandemic, when we see each other in person, 
and play these games in person we would bring food and stuff and now there's always cookbooks and all these things that are all fantasy themed mm. and stuff and now it's like well if i go maybe i can make some food and like we can all sit around and, and be very immersed in it so instantly i'm like oh that sounds really good to me so yeah i think that's it feels like the priority but also yeah i love this idea of the, the booming industries but also like there could be when we go on to like landmarks and maybe uh, uh i think there's another thing that we could we could make something that's like that is the school of magisters or whatever that you know something that about this place that you is a controlling force somewhere else they could visit <laughs> yeah, well yeah that's it because ultimately we're, we've made it so far we've made this big city uh mm-hmm. which has got those sort of uh, vibes but instantly i'm like oh i can actually see this uh, yeah, unusual transport what else we've got we've got your know, organized crime you know cuisine so we've got it feels like instantly i can start to see the sort of outline of it <laughs> The big question, now don't panic if you can't think of anything, because this is where I fall down a lot. What is the name of this particular city? Do you want to take it from the book or do you want to do something completely different? So I really like the name of Camor for the city in the book. I really also have to give a lot of light plaudits to Lee Bardugo because she, I mean, I feel like Camor sounds more Italian and that's Mm. where I'm sort of leaning with it. I also really like, I mean, it's not fictional, but Florence is also a really great mm-hmm. set. I just love anything reset in Aesons Italy. I think it's great. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I'd probably stick with Camor, but I yeah. do think Lee Bardugo did an amazing job with naming Ketterdam Ketterdam because genuinely it sounds like a real city in the Netherlands. Oh, I For a really long time, I forgot that it was Rotterdam, not Ketterdam. <laughs> and I sort of got the two mixed up and it just feels so very sort of like real. So, plot it to here. If I was going more Northern European, mm-hmm. that's probably the direction. I would go in but yeah I'd probably stick with um, Scott Lynch's Camor which is um, yeah he did a really excellent job of the world building it's making me want to reread uh, Gentleman Bastard now when we're yeah. talking about it just cycling back to the food mm-hmm. I found a really great blog online that yeah. has great fantasy recipes mm-hmm. and one of he's got his own recipe for Lembas bread from <gasps> the Lord of the Rings series yeah, uh, yeah. which I am planning on making for my best friend and I because we're currently working our way through the extended editions of Lord mm-hmm. of the Rings because we've been yeah. reading the books for the first time. Aww. So we celebrate finishing one by watching the extended edition. And the last time we watched, when we watched The Two Towers, mm-hmm. I made this blogger's recipe for Shire Couterie, which Aww. is charcuterie, but it's all Hobbit themed. Oh, it's so um, cute. <laughs> so it's really, really great. Hobbit food is the best food. Like generally speaking, if I wasn't going for Italian cuisine, so like, if I wasn't <laughs> thinking really good pizza and focaccia mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. I would probably lean towards Hobbit food, which is basically just really stodgy British food. Yeah. Um, generally, it's like afternoon tea stuff and pork pies. <laughs> yeah, honestly, now you're thinking like you want to reread those books. I'm like, oh yeah, maybe I can get to Asda and get a pork pie before the end of this. Yeah, <laughs> put a pork pie and some charcuterie. So it sounds good. And yeah, this is the thing as well. It's like easily, there's no, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of like uh, city names and stuff like that. So it's, I, I think sometimes people go, oh, but people are going to recognise it or see this. Like you said, this book series, as you found, not many people have read it, so it doesn't really matter if they have. Um, if they have, then there's lots of special Easter eggs for them. Yes. And I have also find that as well, is that players don't go, well, that wasn't in the book, or that's not in the city. You know, like, they go, oh, and they get very excited. It would be cool if it was, right? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, because it's your spin on it. So that sounds very good. So that's the main city sort of built out. We're now going to look at landmarks, residents, and then events or rumours. So that, again, mm-hmm. it's just to make a little bit more character about this place. So let's look at a landmark. In the real world, we associate cities with the cool stuff and places mm-hmm. inside them. When you see the Empire State Building, you think New York. The Colosseum, you think of Rome. The Louvre, you think of Paris. Your city needs similar stuff to have an authentic identity. So we have six options of landmarks that we can choose from. I'll tell you what those six options are. And then once you've picked one, we're going to go down to what its history is, choose two words to define a style of it, and then two materials it's made out of. And we'll just go from there. So your six sort of landmark concepts are you've got a monument, a business, an entertainment centre, a museum, a school, or a public building. Any of those excite you? I feel like I would probably go with business and I'm thinking Mm. like port, like a really good port because I'm picturing quite a flat city. Mm -hmm. I think it would either be that or something to do with the fact that there's a lot of bridges basically because you need a lot of bridges to go over canals basically. So 
in terms of the way it's built and looks, it's like a lot of bridges, but it's got a really good port. I love a port. And again, that sort of we talked about it before that because you were talking about pirates and stuff before. <laughs> so instantly, oh, another adventure that you go going around this place yes. and then you're know, getting onto the boats and stuff. And it gives you the opportunity for really good defense systems for the city mm. because cities that are sea facing and know that they expect a lot of ships have really interesting ways of defending themselves. Like yeah. you know, all sorts of huge chains and dams and traps it's great i love that and they're always secret they are always like oh shit as it sort of appears out of the water yeah it's like oh i didn't know that they had those magic wizards who could control water and it just comes up as a big wall yeah Yeah. i love that (laughs) so let's choose this history then so you've got four options they're similar to the Mm -hmm. history of before so we've got new modern classic and ancient so how long do you think this port with the construction elements in it how long do you think it's been around do you think it's been the same amount of time that the city's been around has it always been here or before so you could say same amount of time and have that be sort of the reason why it started Mm -hmm. but i kind of like the idea of the port or yeah the port's been there longer Mm. than the city itself because that kind of gives the impression that maybe something else was there to begin with and then this mm. you know monster of a city basically went and squished it or eradicated it in a way yeah. and then basically made it all new Ooh, i love that makes the city malevolent <laughs> Ooh, i love yeah well i love getting characters to, to big things like that but yeah like this idea that port was always there and then slowly mm. it has built this almost sort of big growth essentially and then it, the city has sort of consumed mm. it in some way so ancient it sounds like you're going for that Mm-hmm. choose two words to define a style and again if none of these suit mm. feel free to come up with some to yourself because this is the thing sometimes you're like what the fuck uh is when i'm looking <laughs> at this as well so you have ostentatious mm. utilitarian iconic welcoming graceful menacing rustic anarch- oh, i can't say that word An- anarchy like uh yes. detailed so kind of like so i'm picturing something so i mm. work with buildings and materials and a lot of the time so basically i'm picturing a very sort of classical style of architecture Mm. so i think maybe something along the lines of more rustic because it's you know classical and very renaissance but it's not really been looked after in that way right Mm -hmm. so probably something rustic but also utilitarian because i mean ultimately Mm. if you live on inconvenient geography like canals you've got to sort of make it work for you so the Mm. idea that everything has a purpose instead of is just there for show is interesting to me Mm. yeah for the greater good essentially yeah i Mm. love that Uh, and then in that case then we need two uh, primary materials have been made to build this particular landmark so we've got metal stone concrete brick glass mud wood or straw so I'm going to go with stone and brick because I love, I just love stone. Yeah, cobble, you know, cobblestone streets mm. and nice brickwork with stone cornicing and detailing and gargoyles and that sort of thing. It's all oh. good. I just, I love, yeah, stone and brick are just, the, they're the best building materials. I just, <laughs> I don't, they just are. The buildings look nicer when they're in stone and brick. Mm-hmm. Everything else wears away and looks awful. <laughs> yeah, but stone and brick will stay there to the end of time until or until yeah, your exactly. your airship will explode onto them. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing is, like, it's like metal and concrete. I spent a lot of time with metal and concrete, and like they're imperfect. I think if we still had the concrete Romans invented, which we do mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. maybe people would like concrete more. But um, yeah, that's. <laughs> My favourite fact, so the Romans invented a form of concrete that I included in volcanic ash. And their concrete, much like everything else the Romans invented, was better than all mm. things that followed it, essentially. There is Roman concrete still standing now that is on seafront areas where it should have been corroded away years and years ago because the concrete we create now mm-hmm. does. It corrodes away, it splits, it cracks, it eventually fails. You know, it's got a life expectancy, whereas mm. the Romans haven't been around for thousands of years That's now amazing. and their concrete is still kicking about however when rome fell the recipe for this concrete got lost <sighs> and they are still struggling to recreate it exactly what? they can't quite identify the right composition and think or they can't do it cost effectively in a way mm. that it can be reproduced so people take wow. samples of it because there are like say roman walls on seafronts mm. and stuff that are still intact with this roman concrete so yeah absolutely wild the romans <laughs> did everything better i mean they were bad guys they were but like yes. they did everything better 
<laughs> so the final thing we need to do with this particular landmark is uh, the story of it. So we need to know what kind of story this particular landmark is telling. Mm. So I'm going to ask you to pick a number between 1 and 15. And basically that's mm-hmm. going to tell us, depending on what number it is, it's going to tell us what kind of story, like sort of the general vibe of that story is. So if you pick a number between 1 and 15. I'm probably going to be really boring and pick 15 because that's actually my lucky number i really like oh 15. <laughs> well well good news for you the story this landmark tells is inspiring mm. yeah so basically anything about this particular dock and supply it's inspiring or people value it resilient and hardy traders who mm. came up against every odds and still managed to be prosperous something exactly. like that. yeah exactly <laughs> strive 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 as my head yes. mistress always used to say to me and i'm like oh, okay hustle they knew how to hustle from a this uh list of five things i, I want you to choose two essentially to, again these are more elements to incorporate into this particular mm. story or just things to think about so this place commemorates a historical event it holds the city's treasures it acts as a stage for a critical event. Uh, it will offer the player characters a gift. It's a place that the player characters can ask for labour. So you can choose two of those elements to be part of this landmark. Okay, so I like the idea that it might secretly hold the uh, the treasures of the city. Yeah. And a second one, I think a place where uh, player characters could ask for labour is an interesting one because mm. the number one way you ever get out of a port city is usually by offering your services to a ship in, in exchange True. for transport to another part of the world. Yeah. So it's just like, a, we will work your ship if you take us to this place. Mm. Yeah, I like those things. So when, when you say it holds city to treasures, what are you thinking? Are you thinking treasures in the sense of like... It, in my head, I'm always like crown jewels. Uh, but it, but it, I mean, that would be good. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, they could be metaphorical treasures in that without trade, the city would be nothing. But there could also be less metaphorical treasures. Like, I mean, crown jewels are really good. I really love the concept of like the Elizabeth Tower in London that just like basically has all the crown jewels. And it's like... It's wild that it's just there. Yeah, it's like someone's <laughs> entire job just to keep them there, uh, mm. basically. And I mean, trade cities tend to come across lots of different other cultures so the idea that they would also have like a hoard or collection of yeah. treasures from across the world but also hidden that no one knows about secret maybe like a, a customs house because of you know yes. and, they, and they've had to take some things that have been impounded and there's just tax <laughs> yeah exactly and you're like well <laughs> and that's just made me think of you know <laughs> The Harry Potter series, how Filch has just got an entire room of things he's taken off yeah. students. Yeah, 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 yeah. The entire time he's worked there. I've always liked the idea of that, but uh, for some reason, the the secret hidden treasures of the city sort of being held in this port just made me think of um, in Arrested Development how uh, George Sr. is constantly saying there's always money in the banana space. <laughs> yeah, and, and there is. And everyone <laughs> thinks it's, there's always thinks it's a, a business metaphor and it's because the walls are actually lined with money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe that could be it as well maybe uh, again maybe it's not it's not necessarily an impounded customs house maybe mm. there is like a shack of some sort that sells st- you know yeah. stuff but actually it has uh, something that maybe the players don't find out until much later so any of those things i think that's, that's stuff that you can absolutely play with it doesn't have to be like crown jewels in a vault it yes. could be any of those things i really i think that's really cool and then we've got a few more details just to fill in so we've kind of talked a little bit about this about the landmark and what it looks like but if you were going to give like a, a brief sentence or two about what you know if, if someone was coming on a ship to the docks mm. what would they see probably a very vast array of different seafaring vessels basically i like the idea that it's not all just sort of you know you can see pirate ships right next to huge trading galleys and that sort of thing it's a yeah. very diverse thing because uh i don't know i feel like the, the idea that there's like an amnesty it's supposed to be an area of truce that you're not supposed to fight in this particular area mm-hmm. would be quite cool probably a lot of security as well yeah absolutely yeah and i for some reason because it's sort of i'm thinking mediterranean like really blue water like really blue water deceptively clean looking water Yeah, well, that's cool because again, one thing we always say in sort of like uh, role playing games and your and your facilitating supply is it making things that stand out to the player. So using mm. all those five senses, so instantly that blue water, I can visualize that. Yeah. And you're like, oh, as you're coming in, yeah, Mediterranean blue water that you cannot get in England. That yeah. one, you're like, oh, what is this? <laughs> yeah, oh, I love that. The next sort of uh, question: uh, What is this landmark most known for? And who would tell you that information? So if you imagine that I get not necessarily a tour guide, but where mm. would you find information about the dock and 
I guess we've already said like it's famous for importing, mm. exporting, all that sort of yeah. thing. But I mean, it doesn't have to be. One thing that seems to be really common with cities like these in the books that I've read is that they're supposed to have a zero tolerance for slavery. Basically, you're not mm. supposed to traffic people. And it's something that even though they accept almost everything else, they don't agree with slavery. And if you're found to mm-hmm. partake in trafficking people of any sort, there's zero tolerance for it. Mm-hmm. So I like the idea that maybe if this was the only port where that was true, mm-hmm. <laughs> would be quite good. Because mm-hmm. there's obviously always the converse ones where a lot of ports and places where um, boats and, and other forms of transport change places Mm -hmm. they usually tend to be hot spots for that sort of thing right so the idea that it's okay to steal anything but people yeah (laughs) in this particular place and even the lowliest thief begging for change would be able to Mm -hmm. tell you that um, as a foreigner coming to that land that yeah it's the one thing that people don't get away with that would be quite good i like that and and again it sort of enshrines like again that's something that's so different to maybe what we come to expect from reading such books Mm. like oh it's a crime thing or people get sold into human trafficking etc and you're like no not in this world which i think that's such a a strong thing it makes the rest of the stuff a lot more palatable (laughs) yeah absolutely that everyone everyone's out for themselves but there's not no one is in in servitude to another person as a result like you know everyone's on equal level apart from those people who are rich (laughs) it's something that i i you always come across because the thing is where that is a plot device in it. Inevitably, mm-hmm. the people who suffer for it are the women, children, and people of ethnic minorities, basically. And it yeah. just, it feels, in my mind, incredibly lazy. Yes, agreed. I feel like there is so much more interesting things that you can, especially because, I mean, a lot of these series tend to be written by people who can't exactly empathise with yeah. with that experience. So, yeah, I think... It allows you to, it also allows you to develop more interesting, diverse characters as well. Mm. Because if there isn't this constant threat that they could be treated poorly or differently based on who or what they are compared mm-hmm. to the sort of normalized, I, the idea that's very multicultural and multi ethnic and that yeah. isn't a point, that isn't the point yes. of the story yeah. <laughs> is yeah. really, really, I, um, love that. I, I like that because I think it's just, it allows people to really input, really interesting characters otherwise you end up with very homogenous sort of yeah samey groups of people because ultimately mm-hmm. everyone else gets wiped out by something and then the final question i have about this particular landmark is when would the player characters visit this place we've always talked about one about when they maybe arrive mm. what other times would you think the player characters would come to such a place Okay, so I like the idea that somewhere like this is somewhere you have to pass through to trade for different goods and services that you can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Or if you need to look for someone to do a job. So like the Mm. classic heist crew recruitment montage that you end up with. Um, Say you need someone who's got a specific set of skills. You know that the best place to find that person with a specific set of skills is this sort of hotbed of interesting activity Mm -hmm. and it's somewhere that you travel to by sea or maybe somewhere where you just go to where you need to make money because there's lots of gambling houses and things like that (laughs) love that love that so yeah so again there's lots of reasons why the player characters would go to this place and also why they might need to run away from it (laughs) yeah exactly so you instantly got loads of different sort of adventure hooks there so i really like that so okay so that's one landmark and again you could keep going with different landmarks and and Mm. make up different things to fill it out but i think you've already got a really strong one there We'll go on to the the second element, which is residence. So cities are full of compelling symbols and themes, but they really need characters to come to life. This part of the exercise will help you create important NPCs to help drive the plots unfolding in your city. So similar to how we did that uh, landmark stuff before, we're going to narrow the residence down to a specific concept, and then we're going to choose an advantage, a disadvantage, Basically, this is going to be like one person, maybe a character that they'll come up to. Uh, you will choose whether that person is an antagonist, useful or helpful, and then some other elements and just fill out like that person. So narrow down the residence to a specific concept. So we've got public official, a criminal, celebrity, historical figure, a hero, or an ordinary citizen. Public official is always interesting, but Mm. I usually find police enforcement in most of these cities some of the most boring characters because Mm -hmm. either they're corrupt or they're do-gooders and there's really uh, not a lot you could do with them. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea that ordinary citizens are quite interesting people because Mm. immediately what popped into my head when you said about citizens, I was like, obviously, I feel like there'd be a wide variety of different people who are part of this underground thing, but 
ultimately people who get skipped over and this are the people who yeah. are trying to live their everyday lives mm-hmm. but yeah a character that did immediately jump into my head is in the um Sherlock Holmes series one of he has like a network of informants of like mm. um rough sleepers and also um orphan children who yeah. tend to go around begging and that's how they sort of make their money mm. but they also secretly collect information to report back to Sherlock mm-hmm. Holmes and yeah. I played a few Sherlock Holmes escape rooms yes. and read like a lot of their stories and stuff and it, Wiggins comes up all the bloody time <laughs> to the point where it's actually a joke between me and my husband because we played an escape room once and every time he came up it was like a bloody Wiggins <laughs> <laughs> which is basically just he's like in the versions where I've read he's sometimes a grown man sometimes a little boy but I prefer his version where he's a very cheeky little boy who um, mm-hmm. reports secrets for people and uh, yeah. he's just trying to he's just trying to make enough money so he can buy a loaf of bread for his family i love that yeah yeah the 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 baker street irregulars right that's their sort of the network yeah i really like that i like the idea that sherlock holmes is um is like a rallying point for that Mm. because generally speaking uh people who are unhoused Mm. they live a very sort of invisible existence i've done a lot of work with charities in the uk Mm. that um work with people who are sleeping rough or homeless and the biggest thing that most of them talk about is the fact that they feel completely invisible because people Mm. just walk past them but people like that are good at collecting information and they tend to hear and see a lot of things that a lot of people are too you know caught Mm -hmm. up in their own nonsense to notice Mm -hmm. so i yeah like that element but also people who are just sort of minding their own business trying to go trying to show up to work and the day in day out the the not get mugged (laughs) yeah please don't hurt me yeah but it's true like i think there is that sort of power of being i i can have all this information and especially in a setting like this, what we've developed together, it feels, you know, the morally gray stuff. Information is very powerful here. Mm. So I, I think we can easily play into that. So, I, so I'm mm. guessing just from that list, it feels like ordinary citizen yes. uh, is the, the right. one we're going for. All right. So then we've got four choices for uh, choosing an advantage. So something about this person that, mm. I mean, I don't like using the words positive or negative. That's not what I mean, but something yeah. that they use to their advantage, essentially. Yes. So we've got brilliant, influential, wealthy, skilled, principled i like skilled i really yeah. my favorite characters especially in these kinds of books are characters who are just really good at something yeah so like in the six of crows series jesper is a character who has many many flaws and many things he's really rubbish at but he can shoot like he mm. never misses a target like that's mm-hmm. his that's his thing yeah. and there's always like a spider character who's really good at being stealthy and that sort of thing so I like that. Although I will say um, the main character of the Gentleman Bastard sequence, both of them actually were designed by the author to be kind of boring. Not mm. in terms of they're not actually boring once you get to know them as characters, but Locke, who's the main, main, main thief, he is constantly described as he's very forgettable. He's neither mm. handsome or ugly. He's just very plain in a way that people don't remember him which Mm. means he's able to sort of don all these disguises and he can like shed personalities and characters like most people do with clothes because Mm. he's kind of a blank canvas and Mm -hmm. most people will consider it a complete flaw that you've got so little showing on the outside that people find you so uninteresting they don't remember what you look like (laughs) but he uses it completely to his advantage and then like sidekick gene is um i I was gene tannen would probably resent being referred to as a uh as a sidekick but he's like is your classic gentle giant who has had to become very brutalized in order to protect himself and everyone immediately looks at him and sees him as a physical violent threat which he is he's very good with some hatchets Mm -hmm. but he's actually like really sweet and and in in another life probably would have spent his life like creating music and writing poetry oh. <laughs> oh that's super cute i love that yes it feels like yeah it feels like everyone in this particular city that we're creating they, they have to be skilled at something that they get yes. the chance to shine at something so i think skilled works really well you have to be good at something otherwise you don't survive and then uh, same thing but for a disadvantage so we've got impulsive cruel stubborn foolish and then uh, the last one is marginalized i Give, give or take that. I don't. I feel that's a bit of a misnomer, to be honest with you. So, yeah. Or, or, or a choice or a disadvantage of your choice. I feel like stubborn tends to come up quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, stubborn or maybe even arrogant, possibly. Like, Ooh, yes. um, usually hubris is the one that gets most of the thieves because they're so used to being so brilliant that they mm-hmm. never quite see it coming when someone outsmarts them. Oh, I love that. Which I think is always interesting. But yeah, Locke mm-hmm. as a main character is very very stubborn and as a very small child he dislikes losing on a deep and fundamental mm. level and but it kind of makes him vulnerable in other aspects because 
yeah, can never quite give up the game and also forms forms emotional bonds with people that probably mm. uh, would be considered unwise. That's great. Considering yeah. the line of work he's in. Uh, and then same thing again, what we did before. So on the scale between one and 15, that you can choose um, a lower number i'll tell you now is uh, an antagonist the middle middling numbers are useful for the player characters but at a cost and then mm. uh, the higher numbers are they are helpful to player characters so where do you see this particular person that we're making what kind of asset do you think they are to the characters to our player characters i'm gonna give seven i like seven? the number seven mm-hmm. also my favorite characters in most video games are the ones that make you pay for whatever <laughs> whatever you get. Like um, I love the Professor Layton games, which are just puzzle oh, games, but they I have amazing them. they have oh. amazing plots in them. They have some of the best plot lines of some of the games that I've ever just so good. The mysteries are awesome. But I love how every character in every Professor Layton game is like, Well, I'll help you, but you've got to tell me the answer to this puzzle because it's really annoying me. <laughs> You must help me at all costs. Just I, I can't... Can't... In exchange for a puzzle, I <laughs> will give you what I, you want. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yes, so yes, you've gone for, uh, you fell into my trap. Uh, this person is useful, but at a cost, which is great. You can choose from two from the following uh, five options. The person is rapidly changing the city. They are in over their head. They need something important from the player characters. They have valuable information or this person has an unlikely goal. I like valuable information. It always really irritates me when someone you didn't think was important ends up having a goal that you didn't know about, and then you don't factor it in, and then it just it's it's just very much ugh. it's it's like the old days of Scooby Doo, where basically mm. they reveal the villain or mm. they reveal who was the monster, and then they say, "Oh, it's because of this person that you never met off camera." wanted to commit insurance fraud it never makes any sense it's just no it's it's, it's just lazy writing to go aha it's none of the people that you thought it was you have to lay the breadcrumbs Mm -hmm. or it doesn't count so i like just that they've got valuable information yeah and that's what your player characters want to get from them and but what about another one that's you've got rapidly changing the city in over Mm -hmm. their head needs something important from the player characters or an unlikely goal they have i'm torn between in over their heads or need something important from the player characters characters because I mm. the need something important does make sense because if they're going to do some court, sort of trade there needs to be a give and take mm-hmm. but equally because we're talking about ordinary citizens they could mm. be in over their head because they don't really want to be involved in this yeah. big thieving mm. plot heist mm. maybe them giving up their important information gets them out of it I would tell the ordinary citizen that involving yourself uh, is very much giving the important information and probably mm. just keeping it to yourself and not telling anyone is it better better yeah. course of action but <laughs> i like the in over their heads i like how you've described that because it feels like oh, i've got this important information you're like um, but they seem unwilling to give it because they're like where's it are you going to keep coming back to it i just want to sell my buns <laughs> i was like please just just leave me alone i've got i've got you know i've got i've got to be off at five you know that's sort of, <laughs> I, I like that i really like that so i've got to go pick up the kids from the daycare in this renaissance italy place <laughs> What we'll do, we'll keep that as a general sort of vibe of the ordinary citizens, I think, rather than an individual person. I think you can easily from that draw out like individuals that the player characters could meet, uh, like what kind of allies and enemies they might have, and maybe some memorable things. So again, it's a nice little starting point to bring like, okay, these are kinds of NPCs that could help our player characters out when they're on missions and stuff. And then the final thing we've got is an event or rumour. To have personalities, cities need to feel like they're lived in, as though interesting things will happen there whether the player characters are around to see them or not. You want all the ugly secrets, exciting challenges and interesting opportunities to bubble to the surface as soon as the player characters walk through the gates. So we're going to come up with like one particular mm. event or rumour. And again, same sort of format as before. There's going to be six choices and we'll narrow it down from there and then go from there. So your event or rumour, you've got the choice between these six. You've got a contest, a holiday, a power shift, a secret, an opportunity or a threat. Oh, so much to choose from. Yeah. When you said rumour, the immediate mm-hmm. thing that jumped into my head is the opening song for Anastasia, the Broadway musical, A Rumour in St. Ooh, Petersburg. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is completely irrelevant, I think, to this particular story. No, no, but... I, it's it's news that's going around with those ordinary citizens, that they're talking about something. Yeah, someone who everyone thought was dead is actually alive, and mm. how that... and. I mean, the thing that always got me about that is, is it's not necessarily that important, in, I, really. But I do like the idea of a power shift. So say, mm. I don't know, elections or 
the ruling power is about to shift and there's always like a vacuum yes. that could cause uh, distress in that. Yeah. And I suppose an opportunity could be something like a huge shipment of something incredibly valuable is going to be coming in and Ooh. every gang is going to have their eyes turned to how and when it might so that they could... Um, target it that. something like that but um i do I, I tend to think power shifts tend to work quite well and it's something that they would hear about probably as soon as they arrived because mm. it'd be like oh yes it's election day let's go with the power shift because i i agree there's something that that's going to be in baked into everything your player characters do. people on soapboxes shouting and civil distress <laughs> do loads of different adventures in the city and then yeah just feed in this idea that an election is about to happen and and then eventually the player characters mm. they can become immersed in it it's just a regular thing that's going on I, yeah i really mm. like that and i think again the opportunity that i did as a big shipment coming in that could also be fed through in some way as well maybe with the two connected next up we then we have something called choose a schedule so you have three options about this particular uh event or rumor that's going around about the power shift so you've got and what i'll I'll read these out in full just because i feel like just to make it clear what they are so we've got reoccurring this is the sort of thing that happens on a schedule it might happen annually a few times a year or once in a very long while it's generally expected either with excitement or dread then you have dormant this is something that has existed in the past or generally played out behind the scenes it's not impossible that something like this could happen but it is unexpected and then you have singular it is completely unique occurrence and it's not expected to ever happen again. So you would sort of talk about elections, but I wonder if maybe this particular thing, that maybe it's always a bit of a sham elections, but then suddenly there's now, oh, these this could actually happen, you know, this because the power could change. Yeah, I like the idea of the middle one because mm-hmm. it kind of makes me think of if we've got an arist- aristocracy, we've probably got royalty of some description. Mm. And we... I mean, you will know, it's not very often we get a new monarch. It doesn't happen in everyone's lifetime. We have recently gone through that. And I was very surprised. Mm. It did actually make a difference in the UK in a small way. It's weird things like people being referred to as Casey's instead of QC's. Uh, But also it's ultimately very undemocratic, but also not a guaranteed, especially in fantasy worlds, it's not guaranteed to be a smooth transition of power because ultimately royalty has a way of being that way it also made me think and this is very italian and i don't mean to disrespect anybody who might have a feeling (laughs) attached to it but when they get a new pope Mm. and it's done via sort of internal council Mm. that not sort of i mean it's not like they go out to the public and go you should vote for who your pope yeah 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 and then it's also like shrouded in all this sort of secrecy and they all get locked in like a big building and then they put smoke up when they've done that I don't know anything about the selection of popes, generally speaking, but I always found it because it's, it's happened a few times in yeah. my life, but it's not something that happens regularly and you never know when it's going to happen because it's tied yeah. to when popes pass away because it's something they do for, for life, isn't it? Mm. And I've read, I've watched a lot of like the Medici series and usually like the, I mean, the Pope's always a character in it and it's like, oh, <laughs> was the Pope murdered? And it's all like, it's a political thing as well. And there's all sorts of, interesting stuff around like that so i like the yeah. idea that it's maybe something to do with royalty but maybe there are some royal systems in fantasy books where it's less to do with the it's not that it goes doesn't automatically go to the eldest usually no. all of the children of the monarch kind of battle it out in a way and it, there's a bit more of a political element to it so even though it is a um, hereditary mm. monarchy it's not linear by, mm. by age which I always yeah. think is interesting because they try and make it seem like it's always oh, based on merit and who's good at it. Mm. It's not. It's about who's willing ki- who's willing to kill the rest of their siblings. I, that's, <laughs> that's so cool. So, yeah, because before I was like, yeah, uh, you know, elections of that. But you're so right. When we had that transition mm. to Charles, like for me, I didn't really notice it until like seeing the stamps change mm. and seeing the coin change. And that for me really, like, I was like, oh, what timeline are we in? So I yeah. can imagine that actually being a really interesting thing to explore about a, a ruling person. There's been a change mm. of hands. And I loved how you were talking about that. Yeah, there's a selection of popes. Maybe there's a similar process yes. for that. That it's not, yeah, it maybe isn't, like you said, not done by a bloodline. And mm. so that you can really have a good play around with that sort of thing. And oh, that makes me excited. Like when King Charles took over in a, in a strict, like, no one kind of because so many, so few people had had been around when the queen took over. Mm. So few people had sort of lived a life where this had happened. So no one kind of knew what was going to happen. Mm. And there was all these like political commentators who were just like, "Oh well, when King Charles comes to the throne, such and such will leave the Commonwealth." And there was all sorts of like speculation. And realistically, aside from changing the money and and a few, you know, the king's speech and a few title changes to things. Mm. 
you and I will know our life has changed incredibly little yeah. for the church. I think it was incredibly seamless and we actually didn't really notice. But had there been maybe a little bit more scandal around it, hard to believe yeah. that our royal family could have any more scandal around it. <laughs> um, but if there had been even more, it could yeah. have been like a complete dissolution of the Commonwealth, yeah. which is, which just regardless of what people think is like a huge economic and sort of geographical mm. piece of infrastructure that would have made, it would have had impact. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting because there's, there's no template for it of happening, but it, you know, it could happen. Yeah. I suppose because ultimately people pass away. The only thing certain in life is death. <laughs> yes. And taxes. <laughs> and um, taxes, of course. It's a be interesting one to explore through stories and with your players and like, how, mm-hmm. you know, how do people react and putting, yeah, putting yourself in there as like, you know, NPCs, but like, mm-hmm. how do players react who maybe they aren't people from the outside visiting this particular place, mm-hmm. but they're, you know, residents themselves. Like, okay. That's another place they can start. Yeah. So the final few bits of this are like, uh, again, we'll see how this goes. So it says, choose two two groups who are driving this particular action related to the power shift mm. and then one that is being affected in the background. And I'll read it. We've got four choices in total. But again, this is the sort of thing where we were like, oh, it's maybe it's not necessarily groups of people. It's like an individual person perhaps mm. as well. So we've got the marginalised, so people who've been pushed to the outside mainstream society through poverty, tragedy or prejudice. The city is their home, but it will not see them. Then you've got the working class, the people's society is meant to serve, but uh, who do not hold a special degree of power. The remarkable people who have extraordinary or specialised powers, education, skills or responsibilities. And then the wealthy and powerful people who control the vast majority of the city's resources and institutions. They do not see most of the city, but they control it. So you need to pick or think about two groups that drive that particular action about the political shift and then one that is being affected in the background the wealthy always want to say in power shift so i like the idea that the wealthy are warring against the specially trained Mm. and sort of i don't know educated so a bit of elitism versus meritocracy going on in terms of what's going on in power structures but in the background the people being affected usually working class or marginalized people but i would Mm -hmm. probably lean more towards working class in this particular aspect because it'll have yeah yeah, it'll have more to do because it feels like it'll have more to do with like economy and things well that's that's what i was thinking as well it feels like a lot of this is like information is important and also with the the docs as you sort of describe the sort of the idea of hands money and all that sort of thing so it does feel like money more problems oh exactly (laughs) exactly so i love that and then we're going to pick a number again so 1 to 15 a lower number means this event will create a crisis and then we'll choose two from the options i give a middle number is that this event will change the future also to choose two and then on a high number this event will give people what they need choose two so what are you thinking? Where would you like to go with this particular power shift? Is it going to be like super, uh, not negative, but a massive change, which could end badly or something that's really positive for the future? Maybe two or three. Go three. I like the number Ooh, three. Three. Because I don't know, I've been listening to the Empire podcast a lot recently and they're talking about the Russian revolution mm-hmm. and they talk a lot about revolutions and coups and... <laughs> <laughs> all sorts to do with that and i like the idea of i mean generally speaking you don't want the organized crime to become in charge of the city no. um, at least not overtly and obviously uh, right. but the idea that if the status quo is upturned in some kind of revolution mm. and the things that used to be in place don't work anymore that's interesting and also could create quite an interesting set of circumstances for players who are just either passing through or who are based there to have to re- contend with Mm, I love that. Yes, this event will create a crisis, which kind of makes sense because people are like, what what the hell is going on? It can't go well, not in this city. Not in this city, not the way you've described it, no. So here are the five options and you can pick two of these. Again, just keeping that in mind that this event will create a crisis. So uh, the whole city will be drawn in. This creates a special environment that changes expectant behaviours and loyalties. People will discuss silent truths, whatever that means. The city will look and feel different. And then the last one is everything will hinge on a single moment. I like the idea of people will discuss silent truths or things will break down because obviously we talked mm-hmm. about in the book series that we I've sort of taken inspiration from, mm-hmm. there's the secret piece. And the idea that if 
a new ruling class mm. came in and exposed the secret that basically the aristocracy had sold out the general working class people in order to protect their own pockets. Mm-hmm. Working class people don't generally react quite well to that sort of information. <laughs> so um, the idea that if that was actually exposed, because the whole point is, is working mm. class people don't know that that's the secret agreement. They don't yeah. know that it's the secret piece that keeps thieving gangs going. That would probably uproot... Mm. general power structures quite quickly so yeah i think it's exposing violent truths i like that as yes. well like people you can start to hear people whispering at the corners of like mm. bars and stuff and say i then vote for them you know all that sort of thing I, yeah. I love that and then another one the whole city will be drawn in a special environment that changes expected behaviors and loyalties the city will look and feel different and everything will hinge on a single moment yeah, I think maybe unexpected behaviours, because I think once I think people, so so, so once secrets came out, it would make people act differently. Although hinging on a single moment, the idea of like, I don't know, the ports being closed and everyone being locked in is also quite an interesting moment. I think both of those would work well, actually. So we could, we could, we could take two, it's fine. Bit of Gotham, no man's land. Yeah. <laughs> <Throw it in. laughs> absolutely. I, I, cause can you imagine when that gets announced, like we've got a new person and then there's, they start to be writing and they go, like, well, we're closing off the things and people are trapped there. Oh, uh, yeah. It might go a bit v- Viva la France, probably not. <laughs> Viva la France, you'll have um, the purge, all that sort of uh, malarkey yeah. going on. And then the final bits are doing just to flesh out a little bit. So would an outsider know something unusual is, is happening? If so, how would they tell, do you think? Maybe they wouldn't, because maybe this is mm. such a, a city that's so different to what other cities in this world are like. If if this, mm-hmm. say we've got sort of player characters are their own crew of you know, people mm-hmm. on their own quest, mm-hmm. they could probably come around and have a look around and go, oh, probably just what Commode does is yeah, what it's yeah. like. And it's only through talking to people who actually live there that they kind of see there's something a bit odd. Because, I mean, if you know a place is very famous for being corrupt when you get there mm. and it's super corrupt, you're also, you're not super, you're not very surprised, are you? But that's, that's true. So the fact is that there's no real, like, marketing or publicity about the bit it is purely through conversations and snatched mm. overhearing of conversations. So, oh, I really like that because that... That idea, I'm always a big fan of drip feeding, like little bits of story element. And they're like, wait, that wasn't the name of the monarch before. And, mm-hmm. then, and then maybe it's too late. By the time they realize something's happened, there is rioting in the streets. So the city is cut off. And mm-hmm. I, oh, I really like that. The penultimate question is what will be the most significant day for these events? So usually there's like, the day, not the day after, I suppose it gets resolved, but almost no. like the first normal day after mm. the big event. So whether they thwart a coup or a new reigning power does come in, the first day where everyone sort of gets up and goes, well, I suppose the only thing I can do today is go to work. Yeah. It, it's kind of interesting and it introduces that new status quo. Equally, if there is a reigning monarch and that monarch somehow gets killed, that's usually a pretty big day for most people. Mm. They've been killed or passed away. Mm. That, that everyone always remembers where they are and mm. stuff like that. I like, but it's so true that that idea going like again, not to bring it down, but like you know when COVID was happening, and then it was like, well, I guess I just keep going until I'm told not to, and then and then it, oh. yeah, she's like, oh yeah, lockdown will only be three weeks. Yeah, we're like, well, I'll just keep going, and mm, yeah, here we are, <laughs> so many years yeah. later, going. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the final question I have before we sort of wrap up is, for this particular event, how can the player characters have an impact on the situation? So they could get drawn in. So mm. the I mentioned briefly that there's like a political war game sort of element to the third book in this series. Mm-hmm. And the basically is in these elections, each election team employs their own crew of like ground people who kind of pull off almost pranks and stunts Mm. in order to influence the way people vote in the particular election. So Mm. I don't know if there was basically they get employed or somehow drawn Mm. into this Mm. power shift in some way, even in ways that they don't know that they're being involved in that particular thing. They think they're doing something relevant to what they're doing. Yes. That would be interesting. Also, I just, a lot of port cities, I mean, the big thing in Six of Crows is like whenever plague comes in on a ship because mm-hmm. ships inevitably bring, you know, people and animals with them that have got some kind of disease that usually, uh, you know, hits the whole city. So I don't know, maybe something like that. 
I like that idea of like, yeah, they're being played as pawns. Unknowingly being played as yeah. pawns um, because they think they're doing their own thing. And then obviously if, if they get caught, they take the full fall for it because they're, do- yeah, mm. oh, I love that sort of thing that you don't maybe, yeah, like you said, you don't have the full information. So suddenly you're like, oh, we've actually beat up or taken out uh, a rival of, that was to the, mon- and then, yeah. oh, it's on us because we're the faces, whereas, oh I, oh, I love political stuff like that. Secret entry you really should read these books honestly you'd love them <laughs> it's it's on the list now don't, don't get me wrong <laughs> but there you go that is kind of that that's the full exercise that we've gone mm. through and uh, like how do you feel after like spending like an hour or so just talking through like your favorite book like what what do you think what do you find thoughts it was really really fun yeah i am um, i think the thing that's kind of always not scared me off for want of a better phrase but almost always made me shy away from Mm -hmm. things like role-playing games is because even though I've got a very active imagination and I really enjoy playing in those worlds I sometimes feel like I'm a planner not a pantser basically I'm a player plotter not a pantser and for me personally as I always felt that there would be a lot of pressure for someone to be like a DM in that Mm -hmm. so like one of the big We've got, I've got a whole group of friends who'd love to play these games, but because none of them have got any experience in doing it, no, none of yeah. them want to take on the key role of being a DM. And then <laughs> the one person that I do know who would be very good at it because he actually plays Dungeons and Dragons and knows how to do it, doesn't want to because I think in a weird way, he feels kind of self, even though everyone's really interested in it, he feels self conscious about mm. because it's not always what people think it is got. It, it, yes. Different things mean different things to people don't they so one person's idea of what it might be like is not necessarily true to what it Mm. is or etc so it's always been this stumbling block in that that i didn't i wouldn't want to be the one in charge of running the world i would Mm. want to just sort of play in it it. absolutely (laughs) but it is really fun to actually put it all together i love plot twists in books i mean Mm. this series in particular is one that the reason why it stuck with me for so long is because I didn't know what was going to happen at every yeah. turn. And every time I got to a new chapter, I was like, oh, what's going to happen next? And the end of the book, it's not a short book, but it's also not super, super mm. long. And like the gut punch of the ending was so much, I was like, you can't have made me like these characters. Are, I don't mm. know these characters. <laughs> these aren't my people. You can't make me feel this way. But so I like the idea of being along for the ride because I like things. Ha- I, I, I like being along for a plot and not knowing what's going to happen. But I do think there's maybe like a little bit of fun in terms yeah. of um, watching other people experience what, what you know is coming. Yeah. Oh, I know. I, that's one of my favorite things as a GM <laughs> is like to, it's, it's, you it's, wait till they find out. Oh, well, it's, <laughs> I, it's, it's not necessarily a pleasant phrase, but the twisting of the knife essentially is mm. what I, and just, uh, just seeing people's faces when they go, oh, we've been portrayed. And I was like, yes. <laughs> How do you not see? But, who? Obvious. <laughs> but who could it be? It was me all along. Um, but I think yeah, I, I, I t- and I totally hear hear you on like oh I, I'm not sure like you know if do I want to play in it or or do I want to run it as player. But I feel like there's some for me, I love running games because. I feel like I do need a little bit of control about where things are and have mm. these big set pieces in my head. But there is some enjoyment about people leaning into something for the first time. I like what we've created today. Mm. I'm like, I want to play. I want to <laughs> run that. Like, because I, you know, I'm not into them. I'm going to go and get the books after this. But yes. and that's the thing. I, I feel like that's half the battle with being a DM or a GM uh, is mm. getting excited about a setting and a concept. Mm. Rules are rules. You know, we learn board games. We, you know, we, mm. we've done Monopoly. We vaguely know the rules, but if you get them wrong, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Right. As long no. as people are, as long as everyone at the table is willing to be there and isn't so much like, well, actually this is what my character, like it's all about helping each other and, and just being willing to try and do a collaborative story. That's ultimately what role-playing games is about. And of course there are different rule sets that you can try some of them more crunchy than others and maybe require a little bit more thought but ultimately i can imagine you taking a setting and literally just having a d6 and you roll a d6 and the higher the number is uh, the more likely to succeed and you just set in your head uh you you you're more skilled at this so you roll 2d6 and you take the higher number and, and yeah. literally doing that and just going from there so it, there's, there's so much to it and honestly that's what i love about role playing games is being able to take a, a genre or, or a medium that i'm not very familiar with and go oh but what if I could create an amazing story from this and have people involved? So yeah, oh, I'm very excited about this uh, setting that we've done together. I'm glad that, yeah, it was really, really fun. You know, the TV show, The IT Crowd, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, so the episode <laughs> where 
Jen becomes the entertainment manager for visiting people. And obviously up until then, it's been quite debauched proceedings of going to strip clubs and that sort of thing. But she doesn't really know how to entertain these like big hotshot businessmen who don't Mm -hmm. have very much respect for women. And she enlists... She ends up gate crashing Roy and Moss's uh, D and D night, yeah, and yeah. they all sort of don't really understand what's going on. And then when he sort of smash cut back to the scene, they're all intensely invested. <laughs> yes, um, it's one of my absolute favorite episodes of the IT Crowd, and it's something that happens. I think a lot of the times when D and D is introduced into something like a TV show or story where it's actually not central, it's used as like a plot device. Yes, it's almost never made fun of. In my no. experience, generally speaking, it's like almost it, it's always sold as how oh, anyone can get into it sort of mm. thing i think there's i mean i hate the big bang theory like i, I used oh, to I love know. it i used to love it we've when all I was been younger. there we've all been there don't worry we've all watched however many seasons and then we've gone oh actually this is not as funny as we yeah, thought it was um, oh well I've, I've grown to dislike it for whole different reasons as i've got older but some of my favorite episodes is when they get the girls to play D oh. with them as well yeah 100 percent. yeah it's it's always really yeah it, i don't know it's it's interesting i i very much want to i think I might have to hit up my particular friend who's got experience with it and just um, Just make lots of promises and see see if he would see if he will include me. (laughs) Yeah, all you can do is ask. That's the the worst thing (laughs) they can say is no, and then you go, well, if no one else will do it, I will. I will still think about doing it. Uh, No, but I I... maybe maybe I will volunteer to come on. What am I rolling? See if yeah, yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Well, again, I always say if worst case scenario is always like run a one shot one session and be Mm. like, look. This is going to be wild. Don't worry. Uh, we're just going to play it. And then people go, that was that was different. And you go, yes. do, you want, do you want to do it again? And people go, we'll think about it. And you go, well, I've done it once. And you know, and that's the thing. Once you've yeah. done it once, you never have to do it again, I always find. But I, yeah, I was always giving it a go. Well, we've come to the end. And I just honestly, thank you so much for uh, doing this experiment with me, uh, trying something different. If uh, listeners want to find where your work is and where they can listen to your podcast, where can we find you on the internet? So if you want me to talk here me talk incessantly about books you can find me at the books to last podcast which is where all good podcasts are found and you can find the social media for books to last um at books to last on mainly instagram and that's where you'll find out all of our new episodes i am trying to be specific about what kind of books are listed in each episode so people can try and align it with their own reading tastes but if you just want to hear i don't know someone talk about the five books they like um i think it's a it's it's a good time i really enjoy it fiona's episode was really brilliant i thought so <laughs> i don't know i really like all that sort of thing but i do generally talk about books and the books i'm reading just on social media so even if you didn't listen to the podcast you can hear book recommendations there but yeah. yeah i'm I'm a massive fan of like usually on my instagram it comes up you know it's like five books you didn't know and you know like book talk and all that sort of thing i'm like well i've now bought them i uh, am too old for tiktok oh no i don't i know i'm i'm on instagram so it comes <laughs> up it comes up a month later after yeah. it's been on tiktok so yeah 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 but like yeah book talk the idea people go oh look at these five different books i'm like oh yes i don't want i want to read this book because people are just showing me books i'm like yes i'll read that so uh yeah, yeah i agree on that well thank you so much for being a part of the book club and honestly i'm oh, I just I just love creating settings like this. It's been a wonderful time, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a really good time.